actually, I think the pictures might be a lost cause. Usually the other classrooms, you can kind of do half and half on the lights, but with this computer classroom, no options. <laughs> Okay. Unfortunate. We need to see your face just step in the... <laughs> Let me see what this looks like actually with the, uh, with the lights. It might not be the lights off. Yeah, that's not good. Okay, so I better get started. Okay, yeah, 931. So actually, um, today's uh, student, this is a student research conference they do for, um, uh, they do every year here at UH Hilo. And this year we had a student pass away, so it's dedicated to his memory, Matthew Theron. So could we have like a moment of silence for his memory? Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Thank you everybody for coming out, I really appreciate it. My name is Jack Music, and I'm a senior majoring in Japanese studies here at UH Hilo. And my specialty is Okinawan culture, history, and language, and uh, Rukyuan studies. And I uh, just spent a year in Okinawa, and I got back in February, at the end of February, so I started this semester six weeks late, so it was really crazy trying to catch up on work. And the name of my presentation is Uchinaguchi, Indigenous Language of Okinawa, Language Suicide or Language Murder. And what I did was I wanted to pick an exciting, kind of dramatic, <laughs> kind of crazy title so that they would pick me to present at the conference. And, nor and actually, normally these conferences are judged, but they didn't have enough judges this year. And uh, I wanted the judges, you know, pick me because I want to talk about Okinawa. And, um, and I'll be coming back to my title towards the end. So I'm going to speak about uh, some background on Okinawa. I'm going to explain what is Uchinaguchi. I'm going to ask general questions, research questions. I'll explain my method. We'll look at my results, and I'll do a little bit of analysis and conclusion. And the reason I need to do some background on Okinawa is just to um, kind of explain the background of the situation so you can understand where my research questions are coming from and why I asked the research questions that I asked. So these are the Rukyu Islands. They stretch from, ah, normally they have a laser pointer for the teachers to use. Um, they stretch from Kyushu in Japan down to Taiwan. And these are the larger islands. And historically they were the Rukyu Kingdom, which laid in these areas. And it lasted from 1479 to 1872. And the Rukyu Kingdom had really close ties with China. They were a tributary to kingdom to China. They would uh, go to China, pay tribute, and then China recognized them as a country and saw them as an independent country that was equal as uh, Vietnam or Korea was. And actually, the um, uh, China gave the Rukyu kingdom the crown and the robe that the Rukyu king wore. And whenever they would crown a new Rukyu king, investiture it's called, Chinese dignitaries would come to Okinawa and they would, uh, they would officially crown him or invest him as the king of the Rukyus. And then in 16, uh, 1602, I think, uh, the Satsuma Domain, the lords of the Satsuma Domain in Japan invaded the Rukyu kingdom. And they took things over and they started to control. They allowed the kingdom to exist, but they kind of controlled the trade. And at that time, trade was closed in Japan. But the Rukyu Kingdom was really the nexus point of trade in Southeast Asia, because it was close to Japan, Taiwan, China, Korea. So all kinds of sailors would come and trade with the Rukyus. And the Satsuma was able to profit from that. Then uh, the Rukyu Kingdom was formally annexed by, and they kind of had a hands-off approach. They didn't want the Chinese to know that they were controlling things. And the Chinese knew they were kind of there, but they looked the other way. And the Rukyuans, as one uh, Okinawan explained to me, um, it was kind of, they had a really delicate balance they had to maintain because they kind of had a knife at their throat from both ends. And so then in uh, 1872, Japan formally annexed uh, the Rukyu Kingdom. And they were still a little bit hands off, but then in 1879, they abolished the Rukyu Kingdom. They said, you're no longer 
uh, independent kingdom. You're now a prefecture of Japan. And so then that was when they started assimilation policies. They said, uh, you can't speak your language anymore, for example. And they really started to control things and really uh, try to make Ryukyu a part of Japan. And those, so there are six languages in Okinawa. And scholars of language all acknowledge that they're different languages. But the Japanese government says they're not languages. They're just dialects of Japanese. Now, that comes into, like, what's a dialect and what's a language? Now, a la two different languages, even if they're related to each other, like uh, French and Spanish are related to each other, but they're different languages because if uh, two speakers talk to each other, they cannot understand each other. And that's called mutual unintelligibility. Like, it's, I, I can't understand you, it's unintelligible. Therefore, it's a different language. But two dialects, you can talk to each other and you can understand each other, even though you can't speak each other's dialect. So, same thing with these languages compared to mainland Japanese. Japanese people can't understand speakers of the Okinawan languages, or the Rukyuan languages. And even the Rukyuan languages are so different, they can't understand each other either. So, for example, thank you in Japanese is arigato gozaimasu. But if you look at the Amami Islands up there, it's arigata samariota. Completely different. Or kunigami. And Kunigami kind of has the largest area. It goes from, at, Amami Islands are here. Kunigami is actually spoken from this little island down through to here to actually part of Okinawa, the northern part, to about Yonabaru. And um, thank you, and that is Tutiganashi. And Uchinaguchi is, is mainly spoken in Okinawa Island as well as Kumejima and some of the surrounding islands. And Arigato gozaimasu is Nifei Deebiru, or Nitei Deebiru. And Miyako, Miyakojima, in Miyako language, or Miyako Futsu, Tandi ga Tandi. And Yayama, it's uh, Nifayu. And then Yonaguni is this tiny island here, really close to Taiwan, and it's Furugasayu. So even just the words for thank you are very different in all of the languages. And so what's Uchinaguchi? It's the language that's spoken in Okinawa and Kumijima, and some of the other islands. And it's, like I said, it's one of the six languages of the Rukyuan languages. So what's the current state? UNESCO, which is a United Nations organization, they say that Uchinaguchi is definitely endangered. I think it might actually be closer to critically endangered. Now this is the cover for the UNESCO's Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger. There are about 6,000 languages in the world today, and about 3,000 of them are in danger. People are, the speakers are dying out and it's not being passed on to the new generations. Now, their definitions of endanger, definitely endangered, children no longer learn the language as the mother tongue in their home. Now, severely endangered, the language is spoken by the grandparents and older generation. While the parent generation may understand it, they do not speak it to children or among themselves. That's kind of where Okinawa is at today. Most of the people that I met and interviewed in their 40s and 50s, they could understand it, but they couldn't speak it. However, critically endangered, they say the youngest speakers are grandparents and older, and they speak the language partially or infrequently. That kind of fits Okinawa, too, because there are some speakers in their 40s and 50s, but they're really rare. And down to college age, 20s, it's really rare. And the grandparents, they usually don't even speak it to themselves. Even though they can both speak it, they usually just speak Japanese. Now, part of the problem is no classes are being taught in elementary, middle, or high schools. And so the kids aren't learning it. And part of that goes to the Japanese government saying, this is not a language. So how could you teach it? If, if Uchinaguchi is just a dialect, of course you wouldn't have a class, because you don't have a a uh, class teaching people how to speak in, like, Texan dialect. Howdy. <laughs> That'd be, that would be silly. So, um, that's one of the rationales for saying, you know, we don't need a class. It's not a language. It's just a dialect. And part of it's the Japanese education system because the students really have to work hard to take entrance exams. They have to study really hard for middle school entrance exams. 
and then when you're in middle school, study really hard for high school entrance exams. And then in high school, study really hard for college entrance exams. And then once they get to college, they can kind of relax a little bit because their future is kind of, if you get into a good college, you'll get a good job, so on and so forth. And so then there are classes in the Okinawan universities. But because they have to study so hard for entrance exams, it's a barrier to having a class for it. And, like I mentioned, it's not considered a language by the Japanese government. Um, one of the problems is it's not codified. Even with Uchinaguchi, there are many dialects. Uh, Yonabaru, Haibaru, um, Naha. All of these towns had their own ways of speaking. And they were all a little bit different, but they could all, they could all understand each other. So because the language isn't codified, like people in Naha or Shuri, because Shuri was the ancient capital where the king lived and the royalty lived, some of them, for example, might think that their dialect is better than the others. But researchers I talk to say all of the dialects are good, because they're all real Okinawan dialects. And I explain languages versus dialect. And then the assimilation policies. When Japan took over, they said, okay, in public you can't speak Okinawan language. And in the school system, they made it forbidden. And, for example, the students, if you would get caught speaking Hogan, it's called, you would have to wear this placard called a Hogan Fuda. And the teacher would hear you, they'd put that on your neck, you would wear that. As soon as you hear another student speaking it, you would give it to them to wear. And then whoever was wearing it at the end of the day would get punished by the teacher. And sometimes corporal punishment, sometimes just doing extra work or whatever. And um, Hogan kind of gets into one of the problems because it's called Hogan, which means dialect. The children grow up thinking it's a dialect. They think, oh, it's just Hogan. It's a dialect. They don't even think it's a language because it's not called a language. And a lot of the researchers in Okinawa, even though they know it's a language, they just call it a call it Hogan because it kind of challenges the Japanese government to just to call it a language. Because there's a myth of Japanese unity. We're all Japanese. We're all together. So even if you say Rukyugo or Rukyu languages. It kind of challenges mainland Japan. So, in 2011, the newspaper in Okinawa, Rukyu Shinpo, did a survey. And they said 86% of people 70 and up can speak it. And 10% of people in their 20s said that they could speak it. I think that's kind of suspect. Because, in 2012, professors from the University of the Rukyus did a study. And they tested about 4,000 college students in Okinawa at five of the different universities on their Uchinaguchi skill. And they found that they did that with a multiple choice, fill in the blank questions, and then some grammar translation questions. For example, translate this sentence into Okinawan language. And they found that when the students thought they were speaking, they were doing Okinawan language, they were actually just doing standard Japanese, but putting some Okinawan vocabulary words into it. They weren't speaking Okinawan language at all. And that's why I'm, I'm not, I don't really buy the 10% number. Now a positive sign, there are a lot of study groups, people that kind of study it together in small groups in Okinawa, but most of them are, are elder people. They're about 40, 50 and older. And there, to my knowledge, there aren't really any study groups of young children. Because they're always working hard, they're always going to cram school after, after regular school, and they're studying really hard to pass their exams. Uh, recently, the Naha government published about 30,000 books for students in Naha, but they just pass them out. They don't have classes for those students. The best sign is Okinawa Studies 107. Now, this is an immersion school that was just founded um, in 2012 by local Okinawans that are parents. And they had all studied abroad in Hawaii. And they saw the success of the Hawaiian Immersion Program, and they wanted to bring that to Okinawa. And I think it's just thrilling. I'm really happy about it. The only problem is, it's only a preschool. Because, and then they do gradually want to expand it to kindergarten, first grade, and so forth. But because of the Japanese education system, it's going to be really hard to expand it to the to gradually expand it to elder students. But I think this is really exciting, and I'm really looking forward to meeting with them in the future. So language death is a real possibility for Okinawa. 
And that just means, and all of the Ryukyu languages, some of them way more than others. And that just means a language isn't spoken anymore. So my general questions is, how many of the respondents self-identify as speakers of Uchinaguchi? And can they make sentences on their own? And do the Okinawans have relatives that can speak Uchinaguchi? So my research questions are, how would they feel if it were to become extinct? And do the Okinawans ask their relatives that can speak Okinawan, hey, how do I say this? How do I, you know, do they ask them questions about it? So my method was a survey. I made a simple Google survey that students could fill out or people could fill out online. And I sent it to about 65 people that I knew in Okinawa that I had their contact information for. And I had 26 people respond. And they were ages from 20 to 37. And this was my original spreadsheet of all my data. So we're going to look at the results now. So I found that uh, out of the 26, 6 said that they can speak it. And 74% said no, they can't speak it. And this is just them judging themselves. And then I asked them, well, can you form, if you can speak it, can you form a grammatically correct sentence? Can you make a sentence in Okinawa? Two of them said yes, and four of them said no. So they said, I can't speak it, or I can speak it, but I can't form a sentence. So I figure maybe they know some proverbs. Maybe they, you know, know a lot of words. They know phrases. You know, everyone knows chibario, that sort of thing. Um, but the 2% said that they can, let's see, said that they can form grammatical sentence. So 7%, that's about like that uh, Rukyu Shinpo survey that said 10%. So I said, do you have relatives that can speak Uchinaguchi? 23 said yes, and 3 said no. So about 88% said yes, and 11.5% said no. So do you ask them questions about how to speak Uchinaguchi? Four of them said yes and 22 of them said no. So then my research question, how do you feel about the prospect about uh, endangerment of Uchinaguchi? And pretty much all of the answers were kind of negative. You know, kanashi, sad, I had twice. Samishi, sad, lonesome, desolate, I had twice. Um, I think it will become extinct. I feel a sense of crisis, number five. Um, number three is great, because they're taking lessons, they said. Number ten, I think it's sad that even though it's the language of Okinawa, most people can't speak it. Now, this person was the only semi-negative, or semi-negative, semi a little bit positive. They said, however, as over 40 years have passed since Okinawa became a part of Japan, I might be okay with Hogan being gone, too. But like the words of aloha and mahalo have remained in Hawaii, I want local expressions to remain in Okinawa as well. And, uh, yeah, number 26, I think Uchinaguchi will disappear because everyone does not use it on a daily basis. So now we'll look at a little analysis. So first I put this kind of together for me to get an idea of what I need to look at. Two of them can form their own sentences. Four of them can speak it, but they can't form sentences. Twenty-two of them cannot speak it. However, 23 of them do have relatives that can speak it, and three of them don't. So then I got to thinking, so what are the Okinawans' personal feelings regarding endangerment of Uchinaguchi? <coughs> One had kind of slightly negative feelings, and 25 had overwhelmingly negative feelings. And my other research question, do you ask your relatives how to say things in Uchinaguchi? Four of them, yes. 22 of them, no. And I thought it was important to include that graph twice. So my conclusion number one, I think there's an inverse correlation between the number of Okinawans that have relatives who speak Uchinaguchi and the number of respondents who ask them questions about Uchinaguchi. So inverse correlation means as one variable goes up, the other one goes down. Or one's high, they're kind of high and low in opposite places. So looking at that with visually, the majority of respondents do have relatives they can speak it, their grandparents or, or cousins. They could ask them questions. However, the majority of people don't ask their relative questions about how to say things in Uchinaguchi. And my second conclusion, there's an, another inverse correlation 
between the number of Okinawans that have a relative who can speak Uchinaguchi and the number of relatives who can speak it. So, visually, again, most of them have a relative that can speak it, but most of them cannot speak it themselves. So, back to my title, Language Suicide and Language Murder. I wanted something exciting. And I got the idea from this book by Dr. April M. S. McMahon. Now, she says that you might think language suicide means people just stop speaking their language. And language murder means they're forced to stop speaking their language. But she says that's not true. Language suicide is when a new language comes in and it kind of changes the original language. And then the original language is gradually forgotten. And then they can only speak the new language. And she says language murder is when people just stop speaking the old language and then they only speak the new language. And so that is why, that's what I see going on in Okinawa. Okinawan language, by and large, wasn't changed by Japanese. It's just people stopped speaking it. And then even the grandparents that can speak it, they just speak Japanese to each other. So for further research, I would like to conduct this again to kind of clarify my results. And I'd like to do it with a larger sampling pool. And I want to kind of tweak and refine my survey just a little bit to make it better. And conduct it better, more on a wider basis among all the age groups of Okinawa. Because most of my respondents were in their 20s. And also I want to do some research with the Uchinaguchi study groups. And especially uh, Okinawa Studies 107. I have some uh, good ideas because those are actually children learning it. I want to uh, do some research with them as well as uh, some of the college students that, uh, that are studying. I got to enter one of the study groups at the University of the Rukyus and study Okinawan language with them. And so what's going to happen in the future? And the future is always there for us to walk through and the door, like, uh, like Shuremon, like the gate in front of Shuri Castle. Anything could happen when we walk through it. It could be different for every person. And so I think that there can be a positive future for Uchinaguchi. It's not negative, because there are a lot of researchers that are studying it. And so they're going to know all the grammar of it, even if a lot of the people can't speak it. But my survey shows that people really do care about Okinawan language. So I think that we are going to take the steps to save it in the future and to keep it from becoming extinct. And I'll end with... Uh, uchinaguchi kotowaza, or um, proverb. So, acha nu nin chiyami. Tomorrow is a new day. And, oh, sorry. And um, so, with that, uh, I'd like to answer any questions. You know, um, Jack, we had a. Uh, I think this is workshop monthly workshop at Garrow's here. Have you heard about that? Yeah, with uh, Eric Wada. Right, right. And, uh, the Quan Chin Kaupan guys. Right, yeah. right, yeah. And then we had put on, what, what, a couple months ago, there was a little school, you know, these young Okinawan adults, young adults, driving around in you know, Okinawa with their fast food places and ordering in, in the Okinawan language. And it was real interesting and hilarious. I mean, they were having a blast with kids in People serve them a hard time understanding. It. So they're trying to use all kinds of descriptions, you know, in Okinawan language with, to help them come up with a hamburger. You know, they're trying to say hamburger, but they were using the Okinawan language. So uh, you know, like you said, it's really a, the language itself is really uh, 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 is died in Okinawan. We want to use that sense of because of lack of use. Yeah, but it's not dead yet. And there's still hope. And I think those kids, you know, they show that kids, it really does resonate. And the kids really do, a lot of them really do want to learn it. But they're so busy with school that it's, it's really hard to and, make it a priority. And as I understand, you did say that. I think it, some public transportation areas are starting to put up Okinawan language or, or yeah, they did that on the uh, monorail in, in uh, Naha. Um, but actually, one of my friends was telling me they stopped, they took them down 
because um, some of the people complained because they were from uh, Shuri, and they said, we speak a royal language, we come from a royal heritage, that's, that's not royal Okinawan that you're speaking. And so people complained and they took it down. And that's according to a brand and a, a hey comments. Um, Jack, you can stop over or off. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone should be starting here. <laughs> he has it, he has, he has it uh, taped so you can watch the tape <laughs> And uh, Brandon taught for a few years in uh, Okinawa, uh, taught English, and he did some great videos of uh, Let's Sing in Uchinaguchi. Uh, yeah. And oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so he was telling me that they took down the, the announcements at the monorail because people were complaining. So yeah, there's that real division, because there's so many different dialects of Uchinaguchi. Some people are kind of getting territorial, but it's like, we need to, you know, we need to come together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Can you, you show the tag that the student had to wear if there were her, is that now or before? Good question. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Oh. I, I don't know when exactly it stopped. I would imagine maybe after World War II, because after the Battle of Okinawa, uh, the Americans were controlling everything and they were governing the islands. And the Americans actually, they really wanted to revive Okinawan language. And they were kind of encouraging people to speak it more often, but there was kind of a pushback because the, they wanted to become a part of Japan again. Because we don't want the Americans here, so let's become a part of Japan again. And there was actually, I mean, even some talk, the Americans might have seriously considered remaking it the Rukyu Kingdom. And uh, so that's my guess, so that's when they stopped having to wear that placard. And they did the same thing in other languages, like in uh, England, when students would speak uh, Welsh, they would have to wear the same kind of tag. And then whoever was wearing it at the end of the day would be the one that got punished. I think it's big. I'm just thinking. It could be that people of the the young ones especially are kind of ashamed to be Okinawan, and then um, they want to be just like mainland Japan, just being you know. And so they try to hide themselves, withhold them, and not learning. I know when we were kids, we were kind of, we felt that, you know, being Okinawa, we felt we were pushed down and we were ashamed to say that we were Okinawans and, you know, we tried to hide that. Maybe, maybe the students there are doing that now, I don't know, that's my thinking. No, that's a, that's a great observation. Are they coming? Yeah, they're really